on how to optimize a program and uh, uh, a couple of generic methods to uh, analyze the conversion rate of a uh, recursive uh, data log or the logo program. And uh, now we are going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, it's still actually on the same theme of recurs recursive uh, query evaluation. Like uh, reachability is transitive closure, right? It says, you know, we are using slightly different language. And uh, so I'm delighted to introduce Carl uh, Brinkman from uh, the Max Planck uh, Institute, uh, who is going to give us an overview uh, of this topic from the fine grain complexity perspective. <laughs> All right, thanks for the introduction. Can everybody hear me? Uh, okay, so what's this talk about? So uh, I got this invitation from, from Hung uh, that I should talk about recursive curve evaluation, and I didn't know what this term is supposed to mean. Well, so I asked what kind of queries he's thinking about, and he told me about like reachability problems in graphs, distance problems in graphs. Okay, so I can talk about that. Uh, it's not really a concept in algorithms, I would say. There's nobody who would say, I work on recursive graph algorithms. Uh, but there are reachability problems, there are distance problems, so. Um, yeah, let me also mention that this is a huge area inside algorithmics. Uh, so what I will present is a very personal view. Uh, um, and there are also many more experts that are probably much more experts than me on this topic, uh, attending this program with uh, Virginia and Uri and uh, Andrea and lots of others and also the other program with Mikkel and lots of other people. Uh, so talk to them if you want to know more. Um, my databases are graphs. Uh, graphs come in lots of different variants, uh, undirected, directed, weighted, unweighted, and so on. Uh, sometimes there are more variants in the details, like how you encode weights. I will talk about this a bit later. Uh, whether there are negative cycles for your distance problems and so on. So uh, there are other types of graphs or uh, uh, ways to differentiate graphs. Um, typical parameters are the number of nodes and number of edges, but there can be others like the output size of a problem or take into consideration the range of your weights or other things so will also come to play later. So that's my input. And on this type of input, I want to solve reachability problems. So the most basic reachability problem is that you have a single node. You want to know what other nodes are reachable from that. Well, we all know how to solve that, I hope. Well, at least all the algorithms people know uh, that you just run DFS or BFS uh, from this source node, and then in linear time, you find out all the reachable nodes. Uh, right. Now, um, so let's go to more interesting problems. Uh, if single source is easy, then we try to show the, try to solve the all pairs version, right? So we want to know for any pair of nodes whether you can reach it. Uh, in undirected graphs, that's again very simple. And again, we all know how to do this, namely how to compute the connected components of the graph. Like here's one connected component, here's another connected component. And basically by running DFS, uh, again, one can solve this in linear time. Uh, explore, and like whenever you start a DFS, you explore one connected component and then uh, if you have any other unexplored node, you run DFS again, and this only take linear time. Underweight graphs, again, is very simple, very boring, uh, very classic solution. Uh, on directed graphs, the problem becomes interesting. Uh, so there, we typically talk about the, computing the transitive closure of a graph, right? So here it would be, this is our input graph. We want to compute all these additional dotted edges here because, for example, five can reach seven via this path, so we want to add this edge here to the transitive closure. So the, the bold edges together with the dotted edges would be the output. Um, one very easy, easy thing that we can do is just run single source reachability from every node. Uh, so we get time n times m from every of the n possible start nodes. We need linear time in the number of edges to compute the reachable nodes. It's time n times m. Uh, and now, let me be. Let me take a simplistic view in this talk and try to analyze everything just in terms of one parameter. If I just take the number of edges as my parameter, then I can upper bound n times m by n squared, right? Uh, well, assuming that there are no isolated nodes, let me do that. Uh, and that running time is also kind of optimal, right? Because there are graphs where that have like a linear number of edges and a quadratic number of reachable pairs. 
you think of a star where everything here is connected to the middle node and the middle node is connected to everything here, then you get a quadratic number of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, reachable uh, pairs in the output. So the output size can be up to m squared large. So in terms of this parameter, m squared is also an optimal running time, just because the output size can be large. You mentioned like a more efficient encoding, like a harsh diagram of harsh order that encodes this information, but in a more compact, that the output is fast because you don't produce a large number of possible options. Mm -hmm. So how do you make this possible? Uh, depends on what exactly we think of the, what should the output be, right? But uh, let me also be simplistic here in this sense and just say the output should be all the all the edges. Then, then this is. So. All right. Uh, now the other important parameter is the number of nodes n. Uh, if you bound the running time n times n in terms of n, then it's n cubed, right? Because the number of edges can be up to n squared. Uh, this is not really optimal because, in fact, turns out that the problem is equivalent to Boolean matrix multiplication. Sorry, could, could you go back to the previous slide, please? So the uh, output size can be uh, omega n squared, right? Because you are for every pair of nodes, you will, so why but is there it? also, I mean, there are graphs where you get m squared many output edges. Those are sparse graphs. But if you, if I only want to look at m as my only parameter, I ignore n. Then, well, in sparse graphs where m is equal to n, I can get up to m squared many reachable reachable pairs. So this is really the view of only looking at the parameter m, ignore n completely. Then this is a tight bound in terms of habits. Now on the next slide, I completely ignore the number of edges. I only look at the number of nodes. Then n cubed is the only possible upper bound that I can give on this running time here. Right? Um, but it's not the, the optimal time known for this problem because, as I said, the problem is equivalent to Boolean matrix multiplication which uh, is shown here. So what we want to compute is the transitive closure of an n-node graph. Uh, what I'm claiming is that, first of all, there's a reduction from this to Boolean matrix multiplication. So if you can solve Boolean matrix multiplication fast, you can also solve transitive closure fast. And the reduction is this three-line thing here. You write down your adjacency matrix, plus you add self loops for every node. And then log n times, you square the adjacency matrix. We're using this Boolean matrix product. Uh, right. So uh, in the i-th step, basically, you, you detect all the pairs of nodes that are within distance 2 to the i. Uh, so you already know all the paths within distance 2 to the i. If you square the matrix, then you find all the paths within distance 2 to the i plus 1. If you do this log n times, you find everything within distance n, and nothing is further than n away from each other. Uh, Good. Uh, there are just log n Boolean matrix products here. The Boolean matrix product we can compute in time n to the omega. So with just one more log factor, which I'm hiding in this O tilde notation, uh, we can compute the transitive closure. Mm -hmm. Here, what is omega? Well, let's just say it's defined as the optimal exponent of Boolean matrix multiplication or matrix multiplication. I'm not going to make a difference here. Uh, so then this, this is the running time that comes out. Uh, I said that there's equivalence. And really, there's also a very simple reduction the other way around, which is this. So if you want to compute a Boolean matrix product, then you can write down this graph here, a three-layered graph, which encodes the matrix A in between the left and the middle nodes, and it code, encodes matrix B between middle and right nodes. And then if you compute the transitive closure of this, that means if in particular we find out for every node on the left and every node on the right whether they are connected. Then turns out that this transitive closure is actually uh, the Boolean product of the two. Right? Uh, yeah. Transitive closure means there is a path of length two here, and that's the same as saying that the the output entry one comma eight is, is true in this Boolean product. So from the computing the transitive closure of this graph, then you can read off what is the Boolean product, and that means that. Computing a transitive closure of a graph is at least as hard as computing a Boolean product. Uh, in particular, these problems are equivalent, but equivalent up to log factors. That's what I've shown. Actually, something stronger is known that they're even equivalent up to constant factors, but let me ignore that here. So in particular, if well, if we define omega as the best possible running time of Boolean matrix multiplication, then uh, transitive closures has the same running time up to log factors. 
Um, good. So now we know what is the optimal running time for uh, for transitive closure, namely it's n to the omega, and well, we don't really know what omega is, but stop the exponent of Boolean maths multiplication. Um, right, so far so good. So now we understand the problem in terms of n and m. Uh, the database folks, as far as I know, are also very much interested in output size. So let's look at that as a parameter. Um, I can do the same equivalence uh, looking at the output size as the parameter. Uh, same equivalence meaning yeah, exactly the same code as I had before. Um, right. What does it mean? That means that uh, in order to solve the transitive closure, I'm doing log n Boolean matrix products, and every intermediate Boolean matrix product will be matrices that are like subsets of the final transitive closure. So the Intermediate input size is at most the size of the final transitive closure, and also the product that I compute is a subset of the final transitive closure. So also the intermediate output size uh, will be at most the final size of the transitive closure. That means every Boolean matrix product that I need to do in order to find the transitive closure, both input and output size can be bounded by the size of the transitive closure. Okay. So that means uh, I want to have a an algorithm for BMM that is fast in terms of the input and output size. If I can solve BNM in time input plus output size to some constant C, that means I obtain an algorithm for transitive closure in time output size, so size of the transitive closure to the C. Again, it's an equivalence. Uh, yeah. You can do one, you can do the other with only a log factor. Excuse me? Yeah. So if the input is bounded from above by the output, why do you uh, then write it in the big O notation. Yeah, so... Is there, I mean, is there a, a reason or is it... It's not, it's not incorrect. I just want to ask, maybe there's some... Yeah. some hidden... It would be... I mean, alternatively, I would need to write like a second condition that the input size is at most output size. Uh, I didn't want to write this condition, so instead I say you want to be fast in the sum of the two. Okay. Anything a little more um, sensitive in the sense that you could uh, think about like input uh, to the C plus output? No way, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, we will come to that later. Yeah. Uh, for, for transitive closure, though, we don't need that. We did, this is exactly the thing we want for transitive closure. Uh, but I will talk about it later. Okay, so we want to solve transitive closure. We found out that actually we need to solve this sparse setting of a Boolean matrix product, where we have some bound on the input size, so meaning number of non-zeros in the input, we have some bound on the output size, we want to be fast in terms of these two parameters. Uh, Boolean matrix product is widely studied, also very sparse settings, not so much though the version with bounded output size. So the only results that I'm aware of that uh, actually have a bound in terms of the output size are as follows. So oh, actually the first thing is like, what is the like, trivial lower bound for this kind of problem? Um, well, certainly if you can solve, yeah, if you can solve uh, sparse BMM in this time, then just by using the upper bound that the input size is at most n squared and the output size is at most n squared, you can also solve the, the, like this dense case of BMM in time n to the 2c. So that means c should be at least uh, omega half. Otherwise, we get a faster algorithm for the standard setting of BMM. And with the current bound of omega, that means exponent has to be roughly at least this. Uh, some people also like to think about the setting where omega is two, and then this would not be any non-trivial one. Um, good, so the only algorithms that I'm aware of that have specific bounds in terms of the output size are, first of all, these uh, Van Rucht and Ryan Williams and Woodruff and Zhang. Uh, they show uh, an exponent of 1.5, and it's a combinatorial algorithm. It's not using fast match multiplication, so it doesn't depend on the value of omega. Uh, and then Amerson and Pei, they showed uh, that one can get the, the triangle detection time. So two omega with omega plus one, that's about 1.41 with the current bounds. That's the exponent of triangle detection, and they showed that one can get this exponent also for the sparse setting of BMM. 
And what we recently did, or recently put an archive uh, with, uh, together with uh, Amir, who was here, and uh, Nick Fisher and Martin Kittelman, uh, we improved this uh, exponent to, uh, well, with the current omega, it's 1.3459. Uh, if omega is two, it, I mean, it doesn't beat the state of the art and it would again still be a four third. But with current omega, there's an improvement. Uh, the precise bound depends on mu, which is one of the constants related to matrix multiplication, uh, namely this one here, if you're interested in. It's, we, we, it's known relatively precisely that mu is roughly uh, 0.5. Um, anyways. Uh, um, so kind of the surprising thing here is that uh, uh, it's, it turns out to be simpler than triangle detection. For triangle detection, we do not know how to solve it in this running time. Uh, for this uh, output sensitive or fully sparse BMM, we, we know how to do it. Um, yeah, kind of the difference is that uh, in triangle detection, uh, you want to multiply two of the edge sets and then check for every edge here whether it was a one in the product uh, but the product can be very large, right? There can be many pairs connected by two parts, and we are only interested in very few uh, uh, outputs of this product. And it turns out to be a more difficult setting than if you say, if you already have a guarantee that not too many pairs are connected by two parts. We also mention that this is deterministic uh, for BMM. We can generalize it for two integers, even for integers with positive and negative entries, meaning there can be cancellations, meaning the output size can be smaller than you would expect because of cancellations. Even then we can get the same running time, but then it will be randomized. Yes. Is there a uh, meaningful consider other formulations of the cost as a function of input and output, like input to some exponent and output to some other? That's the next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, now uh, the one after that. Um, first, uh, let me ask whether further improvements are possible. And so in the same work, we also show the following equivalence, namely that if you want to improve upon our algorithm, if we want to get a, an exponent less than what we get here, then you need to do exactly the following thing. You need to solve an all edges triangle problem in some fast running time. What is this problem? It's a problem where you're given a graph with a tripartite graph with n nodes here, n nodes here, and to the mu nodes there. So remember, mu is about 0.5, so that's roughly root n nodes in, in this part. And we also get an upper bound that there are not too many edges between these two big parts, only into the one plus mu. So roughly n root n edges between the big parts. And then for, for any edge down here, we want to know, is it in a triangle or not? So there's one output bit for every, for every edge down there. Is it in a triangle or not? Um, that example, I mean, it turns out to be uh, an example where, like, if you uh, enumerate two paths, you get roughly this running time. If you run matrix multiplication, you also get roughly this running time. So basically, all the approaches that we know how to solve this kind of problem lead to this specific running time, 1n to the 1 plus 2 mu on this kind of instance. And uh, if you improve on this instance, this running time, then you will also get a better output and a fully sparse BMM. Uh, it's, it's an equivalence, so yeah. It's not really a conditional lower bound uh, because, well, there's no hypothesis stating that this kind of instance of all its triangle is hard. And we don't know how to base this hardness on anything, um, but at least it, uh, it kind of simplifies the problem in a sense that uh, here there's no bound on the output size or anything, right? The, all of these edges could be here, so uh, kind of have a dense output. So it kind of simplifies the problem, and you know you only need to solve this simpler problem to get it faster. Uh, now comes the answer to Hong's question and Paris' question, namely, uh, well, why would we want exactly this input plus output size to some constant? Well, not necessarily. I mean, we do want exactly this for the transitive closure, but in general, the problem is uh, interesting for any other relation, right? So uh, let's suppose that the output size is roughly the input size to the R for some constant R. And actually, this R could be anywhere between zero and two. Um, and then we can draw the running times of algorithms in terms of this R. So here is R, meaning 
Uh, at the very left, the output size is super small compared to the input size. At the very right, the output size is super large. Uh, and here's the, the running time complexity. And uh, I guess what the green region is, well, you, it needs to read the input. So you at least get uh, exponent one. You also at least, at least need to read the, uh, write the output. Uh, so that gives an N to the R lower bound or an R lower bound here. And I don't know, this is the two is some trivial upper bound. So the green region is where reasonable algorithms live in. And then there's a Van Ruchtedal algorithm that's uh, input size times square root of output size. So it's the, the black line and that does not use fast multiplication. And Amerson and Pei, they improved this to this blue line, which is kind of hard to describe, but uh, yeah. And uh, we got it to this red line here, which, well, it's basically always a little bit lower. Uh, this here is the like one type of bound on our running time uh, that describes this the, the, the solid black line. We actually can improve it a little bit further to the, to the dotted uh, uh, red line. But yeah. uh, it's not so easy to make sense of what this is uh, at a particular point, but uh, uh, let me uh, point you to one interesting factor, namely that we do get near linear time in the output size if the output is large enough. Uh, so if you, if, you, if, you want to, if you want to view this result uh, in, uh, very coarsely, uh, then for example, one can bound our running time by this, by the input size to something less than two plus near linear in the output size. And really it's the first algorithm that I'm aware of that gets this like, near linear in the output size plus subquadratic in the input size. Is it uh, every light type of argument? It's the next slide. <laughs> what is the edge, the, the, the dotted line as opposed to the solid red line? Yeah, so the dotted line is we take uh, a, a table of bounds on certain matrix multiplication exponents, like rectangular matrix multiplication exponents. So it's like a table of uh, 40 different bounds for certain settings of, of uh, the dimension of the matrices. And then we put this into an LP to, that produces us a, a bound on our running time. Uh, and and what, what comes out numerically of this LP is this dotted line. And what we can prove easily analytically is this, is this solid line. So it's a, it's a different bound on the same algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, the picture simplifies if you assume omega is two. Then we simply get this, this, this improvement here. Uh, in particular, if you just want to say it in, in this form, then it's nearly near in the output size plus input size. Uh, and this year also, like the true running time then becomes this input size times output size to one third plus output size. Yes. So since you're near linear in the output side, can you also enumerate the small delay or something like that? No. Uh, actually, we discussed this yesterday, and at least I don't see how to do it, but it would be super interesting to get that, yeah. Uh, does your algorithm need to know the out or have a constant approximation of the out? Yes, it uh, does not need to know out. Yeah. It does not need to know. Uh, all right, that's the answer to Hans' question. Um, very coarse overview of what this algorithm is doing. Uh, so let's suppose this A matrix has dimensions X times Y and the B matrix has dimension Y times Z. Um, then the first step is to, that we do is to densify the output. So we use certain hashing tricks. Uh, some people would call this sparse recovery to reduce the outer dimensions so that the product of the outer dimensions just becomes linear in the, in the output size. Um, Ask me about this later. I'm not going to talk about this now. It's, it has been used for this type of problem before. So. And the second step, once the, once the outer dimensions are small, uh, we basically follow the uh, kind of standard high degree, low degree argument that we split the middle nodes into high degree nodes and low degree nodes. And then low degree nodes, we can easily enumerate all two paths. So choose any input edge choose any of the delta outgoing edges of a low degree node, then you enumerate all two paths. And therefore also enumerate all pairs of endpoints that are connected. 
And in high degree, we do match multiplication, right? Match multiplication meaning um, for the middle nodes, we only use the high degree nodes among y now. So we get some kind of matrix multiplication of this form. We have to bound what is the complexity of this matrix multiplication. Uh, we use two bounds. So first of all, we use that the, the uh, that we uh, densified the output, meaning that z can be at most out over x. And then we use that all the all the y's are high degree, meaning we have can have at most input size over delta many high degree nodes. Okay. And um, x also cannot be too small or too large, basically because if you want to have in many edges between these two, you cannot have less than delta nodes here. Uh, okay. So that is the complexity of this part. Uh, basically, the one important new thing that we show is that you can bound this by uh, the most imbalanced of these terms. Uh, so that you can just plug in the smallest possible x, you get an upper bound on this running time for any possible x. Uh, it makes sense intuitively because Matrix multiplication is harder if the matrices are more imbalanced. Uh, proving this means that we actually have to open up uh, the, the tensor decomposition framework of matrix multiplication and prove some, some relations on, on tensor rings. Um, right, and now we get two terms in our running time, like the two path thing and the matrix multiplication thing. Now we just need to balance these two terms by plugging in the right delta using upper bounds on matrix multiplication to, to do this. And it turns out that if input size and output size are the same, then what you get by balancing this is exactly the expression for, uh, for this new constants of matrix multiplication. Um, so you get Anyways, it's a very vague overview, as I said. So how, how close is it like to any implementation? So assume like you take the matrix multiplication, you take a simple exponent like class which of these different things are close to being implementable? Because you have different steps, different assumptions, and can you imagine there's any regime in which any correct implementation would be the default practice implementation? Yeah, so uh, let me actually first mention that um, all of these steps have been used before. Like this, this high degree, low degree is super standard. Like basically all of the algorithms are doing that. Uh, the densification, hashing, sparse recovery, has also been used, like not exactly in the same way as we're using it, but has also been used for certain types of smart multiplication. In so theory. in theory, or at least I'm only aware of in theory, I can't really say that it has been used in practice. Um, uh, so so like the, the algorithmic ingredients here are not new, the, the, uh, well, not really at least. Uh, the like the main new thing is that we get tight upper bounds on the running time of this. Uh, did, I, did I say this correctly? Yeah. So okay. So that was the, the uh, that was that was the disclaimer that uh, uh, whether this is I mean uh, uh, there was a disclaimer because I mean uh, these algorithmic ingredients and have they have been used before so. Uh, I would expect that they have been also been tried out in practice, but I don't really know. Um, whether this is practical, the sparse recovery definitely is used in other areas. I haven't, I don't know whether it's being used for matrix multiplication. I, I'm not an expert on the practical side of this. Uh, this here is super simple and definitely is being used. Whether you should use Dense matrix multiplication at some point, whether it makes sense to use Stressen at some point here. I don't know. I don't, I'm not aware of any practical work on this. Uh, uh, does this generalize to a chain of matrices? Yeah, three or four matrices? Um, only in the sense that, well, the, the input size of the second product would be the output size of the first product. At least we don't have any better bounds than this right now. But it would be interesting to look at it, yeah. So we actually have a paper in Sigma of the three years ago where we implemented this, this type of thing. Including the hashing. The hashing but not the hashing, the high degree, degree low degree, dense matrix. And there was a follow up paper. So it is, it is, it really works, but you don't use trust and you use 
just a, a library of faster classification. And they do vectorization, this kind of thing. So it's, it's much faster. But you still do, you actually use a, your hardware to do fast dense matrix application, not your algorithmic input. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's also what I would expect. Like the, like I the one of the, like, uh, one of the philosophical perspectives on fast multiplication is that it makes sense to design algorithms that use fast multiplication because there are circuits doing it fast or fast implementations doing it, right? Uh, one thing is that modern chips, like, I don't know, I'm not sure whether this thing has it already, but uh, uh, they, they, they implement, or they, on the CPU, they have special circuits just for matrix multiplication, right? It's just for... Uh, I'm not sure what is the current size, something like 20 by 20 matrix multiplication. You have a specific part of your chip dedicated to that. So uh, so you can just speed up any dense matrix multiplication by repeatedly calling this part of your of your CPU. Uh, so, so there is hardware acceleration for matrix multiplication. It's not, it won't give the same running time as Trussen, but it will give some speed up for dense matrix multiplication, uh, which you can then use in this dense part. This is real matrix multiplication in the chips? Yes. Over the real things, yeah, yeah. I'm floating point, but yeah. So this output densification is not a crucial step in, 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 in the end. Here it's crucial to get our bounds. So, yeah. are, are you going to show us the uh, output des densification? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I talked about all this stuff. Um, this year was the important part, right? We started talking about reachability questions, about transitive closure, uh, how this works with parameter n and m. And if you talk about the parameter being the output size, then the best that we know now is output size to the 1.3459. And uh, we don't really know what is the optimal exponent. With the techniques that we are aware of, like four third actually is, uh, is uh, like at least a barrier. Um, and this is very close to four thirds, but, uh, but we don't have like a nice conditional lower boundary. Good. Then I can talk a little bit about distance problems in graphs. Um, if we talk about distances, then we need edge weights or edge lengths. So every edge, every edge should uh, come equipped with a weight. And uh, we somehow need to also encode these weights. And there are actually lots of different uh, models uh, how to do that in algorithms. Um, so generally, I'm assuming the RAM model here, meaning every edge weight fits into a cell of my machine. Uh, maybe a constant number of cells, I don't care. And uh, arithmetic operations on two machine cells can be done in constant time. Yes, on that. Uh, but even then, um, I mean, we can talk about integer weights, meaning integers in between some minus w and w. Um, and even if we say integer weights, then there are different regimes of how large these, these integers are. Uh, so if these weights are near constant, then we can afford W factors in the running time. We're totally fine with that. And if the weights become larger, say polynomial in N, then we don't really want a W factor in our running time, but a log W factor is totally fine. It's even so fine that we can hide it in our O tilde notation that we typically use in algorithms. Um, once uh, these weights become, let's say, slightly super polynomial, then we we are still fine with log w factors, but we don't want to hide it in no tilde because it's a bit more than log n. And, uh, and when the weights become so large that we don't even want log w factors, then typically we want a strongly polynomial algorithm, meaning an algorithm whose running time is independent of w. And how can that make sense? Well, I'm still assuming that I can do arithmetic operations on machine cells in constant time. So I can operate on log w bits in constant time, basically. Uh, but I want that the number of arithmetic operations is independent of, of the actual numbers. That's, that's a strongly polynomial regime. And all of them make sense depending on well, how your input look, looks like. Um, of course, not everything is integer, so you can also, we can also look at real weights. 
And then uh, if you can either think of really a real RAM machine where you can store real numbers in machine cells, and you can do arithmetic, arithmetic operations on reals in constant time, or you can think of really floating point ap uh, approximation. So, um, so that would mean that your input already comes in floating point, you, you calculate with floating point numbers, it also means that the output, you will most likely only be able to produce a, an approximation of the result. Uh, and then there are different implementations of this floating point, uh, different assumptions on how many bits there are in the mantis and exponent and so on. Uh, all of these are being used in algorithms papers. Uh, all of them have their uh, justification in certain settings. So um, uh, I guess the, the, the two models that I see most are these two. And the one that I will be focusing on in this talk is this one. So I will make log W factors explicit. Um, so I guess the, the takeaway here is that, first of all, algorithms people, they should specify in their papers what of these models they use. Uh, and the database people, they should take care in checking, like, what are the assumptions of algorithms that they're using? And some, sometimes it's only visible in the fine print of the papers. So. All right. Um, again. Easiest problem, the uh, easiest distance pr problem is a single source shortest path, right? Given a source node, compute all distances to all other nodes. Um, that's very classic. We know how to do that, right? Non-negative edge rates, you run Dijkstra's algorithm in near linear time. Actually, well, do we actually know how to do it? Well, for general edge rates, not really, right? Uh, there's this classic Bellman Ford algorithm that computes uh, shortest paths in graphs of negative edge rates in MN time. And then uh, people develop the scaling-based approach where uh, you do somehow log W rounds of something, log W rounds of getting closer and closer to the true distances. Um, so then the, the running time actually depends on the range of the, of the integers. Uh, and uh, this was uh, yeah, developed in the 80s and 90s to be uh, roughly time m root n. And then there was this recent breakthrough by Aaron Bernstein, who is, I think, an organizer of the other program, right? And Dan Nanankai and Christian Wolknison. And they got the best paper award uh, last year at Fox to get rid of this root n factor and get really near linear in m and, and one log w factor. So it's still a scaling based algorithm, it still has this log w. Uh, but other than that, it's near linear in the number of edges. And uh, we've further improved this recently. Uh, so this had about nine log factors. We brought it down to about three log factors, which I guess is still not super practical, but uh, well, getting closer. Um, right. So for distances, already a single source version is interesting. Uh, actually, the big open problem here is whether this log W can be removed. Or, or, uh, yeah. I get a strongly polynomial algorithm that is near linear in the number of edges. Okay. And then, of course, we can also talk about all pairs again. Um, surprisingly, like the, the, we get all, had all this headache for the single source version with negative edges. For all pairs, you can just get rid of uh, negative edges. It's a general purpose reduction that uh, transforms a graph with negative edge rates to one without negative edge rates, and it runs in NM time. It's long known. Um, okay, so how fast can we solve all pairs per shortest path then? Well, certainly you can run Dijkstra from every node, just as we did for all pairs reachability, right? We run a reachability algorithm from every node. And you do this once for all of n nodes. Uh, you run in near linear time in m by using Dijkstra. Um, so that's roughly n times m time. Uh, again, if we look at parameter m, we can upper bound this by m squared. And again, that's kind of optimal because the output size can be up to m squared, right? Output size would be all pairwise distances, which is m squared, which can be up to m squared. Uh, in terms of just the parameter n, uh, n times m, we can again upper bound it by n cubed. Uh, and similarly, as for transitive closure, there is an equivalence to a different matrix product. So this time, there the uh, equivalence is to min plus product, where the i comma j uh, entry of the output is the minimum over all k of a i k plus b k j. If you can compute this kind of product uh, 
in whatever running time, you can compute all pairs through this path in the same running time with a log factor more. And it's really the same reduction as before. Um, you did now take the weighted adjacency matrix, you add zero weight self loops, and then for log n rounds, you repeatedly square the matrix using now min plus product. And the same reduction in the other way around also still works that uh, if you want to compute a min plus product and you can compute all pairs through this path, yeah, you can do so. Uh, so both problems are equivalent in the same way as before. Uh, actually, Virginia and Ryan, they showed that there's one more very interesting equivalence here to a negative triangle, which I don't want to go into detail here, but uh, I guess this was discussed in the boot camp, so I don't really have to. Uh, this is a little bit different kind of uh, an equivalence. Like here the equivalence is that uh, the running times are the same up to log factors. Here the equivalence is that if one is subcubic, also the other is subcubic. It doesn't mean that you get the same subcubic time, but uh, if one is subcubic, also the other. And then the all pairs shortest path hypothesis states that all of these problems well, cannot be solved in subcubic time. Okay. So that means uh, in parameter n, we can solve APSP in n cube time, and the optimality of this is the APSP hypothesis. So we don't know whether this is true, but it's one of the central hypotheses. Uh, let me also mention that uh, Ryan was able to shave off these log factors here, or more than log factors, due to the root log n. But it's not uh, into the 2.99 time, so this is the fastest known algorithm in theory for APSP. Okay, um, now, um, yes. Before you move on, uh, what is the exponent in the sparse model for the first part? So in terms of n? Uh, so in terms of n, it's, uh, you know, it's APSP hardness is n cube, but let's say the, the both of the matrices are very sparse. I mean, the same as here, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so that's the best, like, yeah. Again, if you have like, a star-like thing, there can be n squared outputs. So. Oh, yeah. Good. Um, now, for transitive closure, we talked about the output size for APSP. That doesn't really make sense, right? The output size is always n squared. You want to know all the n squared distances. Um, so that relaxation doesn't really make sense here. Uh, instead, it now makes sense to talk about approximation now. Right. This is kind of the first place where it makes sense to talk about approximation algorithms. Right. Reachability, you cannot approximate. Single source distances, we said, are anyways in near linear time, so you don't need to approximate them. Uh, APSP is really the first problem in this talk here where it makes sense to talk about approximation. Now we want to approximate all pairwise distances. How, is, how hard is that? So um, it turns out that there is a reduction from Boolean matrix multiplication. Uh, which is again the usual reduction that you want to multiply two Boolean matrices A and B, and you write them down as a three layered network like this. Then if you compute, if you even just approximate distances from left nodes to right nodes, then you know whether they are connected, right? Because uh, like if, if they are connected, if there is a one in the output for, from two to seven, that means the true distance is two. If they're not connected, the true distance is infinite. So uh, if you get any kind of approximation of the distances, you know, can distinguish two from infinite. So uh, in particular, you know, uh, the Boolean product, yes. So this is an exact Boolean matrix all the time, right? There's no... This is exact BMM, yes. It's at least as hard as exact BMM, yes. Approximating APSP is at least as hard as uh, exact BMM. And that holds in directed graphs. If you get a good enough approximation, a better than two approximation, it also holds in undirected graphs. Uh, really because uh, if they are connected, the true distance is two. If not, then the true distance is at least four. So if you can distinguish two from four, if you get a better than two approximation, then it's, uh, you also need to be able to compute a Boolean matrix product to, to get this kind of approximation. Okay, so n to the omega kinda is uh, lower bound for. Um, so we can, um, first question now of course is can we get n to the omega? And that is what uh, Uri did uh, some time ago, that um, one can uh, one plus epsilon approximate all pairwise distances in this running time here. So this is really n to the omega. Uh, there's some dependence on epsilon, but let's say you want a constant factor, then epsilon is really just a constant. 
and there is a log w here. Right. So this matches this lower bound here. Um, one can actually argue that there, sh there has to be some polynomial dependence on epsilon I mean, under some version of the APSP hypothesis. Um, oh yeah. Let me also mention that this is, again, follows from the same kind of equivalence as we have seen before, that uh, approximating APSP is equivalent up to log factors to an appropriate matrix product. And in this case, the appropriate matrix product is some approximate version of min plus combination. Um, of course, now can ask, is this log factor necessary or can we have a, a strongly polynomial time algorithm? And that's what we answered some time ago, that in undirected graphs, this is actually possible. One can shave off this log w and replace it by log n's. Um, so there one can shave, off, shave this off. In directed graphs, it's not really possible. Uh, turns out that well, you can get rid of the log w at the at the cost of worsening this exponent to three plus omega half, uh, and this is also kind of necessary because approximating APSP in directed graphs turns out to be equivalent to exactly solving the min max product of two matrices. And for this problem, the best that we know is, is, is this kind of one. So again, there's some equivalence to an appropriate matrix product that tells you the answer. Um, good, so this is, I mean, we, we saw this n to the omega lower bound. If you want n to the omega or close to it, then those are the results. Uh, now there's one case where that could allow you to be better than n to the omega here, right? Namely on undirected graphs and you want a two approximation or worse. That is not excluded here, right? Let's focus on this now, uh, namely that we want just some constant factor approximation in undirected graphs. That also turns out to be possible. Uh, Uri and Mikkel showed at some point, uh, also a long time ago by now, <laughs> um, that one can take an undirected graph and pre-process it, pre it in this time here. So what is k here? You can fix any constant k. Actually, it can be even super constant. Let me focus on the constant case. So you can fix any constant k, and you can preprocess your graph in this, well, almost linear time, right? m times n to the 1 over k. If I choose my k to be 100, then this is very close to linear time. And then after this, so this preprocessing builds some data structure such that I can then give two nodes u and v to this data structure, and the data structure tells me uh, a constant factor approximation to the distance from u to v, namely a 2k minus 1 approximation. And the data structures, the, the query is also super fast, like it answers this in constant time. Um, right. So this, this tells us like, that we can avoid this n to the omega if uh, we are in undirected graphs and our approximation ratio is some large constant. Uh, and what we did recently is, the, is to show a kind of a, a matching conditional lower bound, or nearly matching conditional lower bound. Namely, if you assume the three-sum conjecture and you allow the same kind of preprocessing time as here, and you can, we can even relax the query time to be log n or poly log n or any, any sub-polynomial function n into a little of one. So even with some, some relaxed query time, uh, one cannot compute a better than k approximation. Um, okay, there's still a factor two missing here and that's, that, that, that gap still remains. Um, but at least kind of qualitatively, this, the, the same, this result is also tight. And this was shown uh, with, with Amir, who is here, and Sari, who is here, and Orr, and Nick. And uh, there, there was this first paper here, which had kind of worse bounds. And then uh, the second paper has better bounds. And independently, the same bounds were also shown by S and uh, John. Uh, sorry. Um, Yes, um, right, and this like this is kind of one example of a hardness of approximation in p result. What does it mean? It means that uh, well, we, we have some problem that can be solved in polynomial time, but exactly it's kind of costly. So you relax to just approximate this polynomial time problem, um, but then you can still maybe not solve it in near linear time, and you want to still prove some fine-grained lower bound just for approximating this polynomial time problem. And this is possible for some problems. Like this is one example. It turns out to be super hard uh, because I mean, you not only need to be 
uh, fine grained enough not to lose any factors in the running time. You also need hardness of approximation techniques. Combining that turns out to be very difficult. Um, but, uh, some cool results in this direction. Okay, uh, coming to the end. Um, so, I mean, I try to give like a survey-ish intro to uh, reachability and distance problems and graphs, right? Turns out, at least for the problems that I looked up here, this, this, the, the, the single source variants, they are all very simple, right? They can be solved in near linear time. Or pairs variants turn out to be not so simple. Um, but they're also equivalent, they're, they're all equivalent to some appropriate matrix product. And it always turns out that you want to solve some distance or reachability problem, up to log factors is equivalent to some appropriate matrix product. Uh, maybe this is one reason why recursive queries are not really a thing in algorithms, because they are all actually equivalent to non-recursive queries. Uh, uh, of course, there are more, many more directions here that I did not discuss at all. I think the, the boot camp kind of covered a little bit these centrality measures of diameter, radius, girth, and so on. Um, instead of multiplicative approximation, there are very interesting additive approximations for APSP. Uh, there is the setting of near constant weights that is also interesting. I didn't talk about it at all. Um, you can look at uh, these problems on dynamic graphs. You can look at failing edges. Uh, you want to find the shortest path after one edge fails, uh, spinners, whatnot. Uh, it's a huge and active research uh, area. And uh, as I said, there are lots of people here that you can talk to if you want to know more. Uh, that's it for me. Take questions at two when we are back here for the discussions. I want to convince you that uh, because it probably is a thing in <laughs> So let's do that at two. <laughs> um, yeah. well, thanks. I don't want to be like people.